Okay, Here Alistair, you. over to you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's webinar on renewable energy, and thank you for attending. Uh, this forms part of uh, Bath and Northeast Somerset's Climate and Biodiversity Festival, which has just started, and the, in the lead up to the International Climate Talks in Glasgow in November, COP26. And as part of the programme of events, we're discussing key issues and celebrating local practical action that's helping uh, the area to meet its zero carbon and nature positive targets. We're recording the session so that it can be uploaded onto the Council's YouTube channel for those who can't be with us here tonight. And we're here to talk about how we can increase renewable energy generation in the area. And I'm joined by a fantastic panel of local experts in the field who will share their expertise. But let's start with some context. In the Baines Climate Emergency Declaration in 2019, we committed to providing the leadership to the area to achieve net zero carbon by 2030. Carbon footprint modeling in 2019 indicated that the way we could do that was largely through three particular initiatives. One was by changing the way we travel, making it less carbon intensive and doing less of it. Second was by making our buildings much more energy efficient. And the third was through a significant increase in the amount of clean renewable energy generation across the district. And as a council, we're looking at what enabling mechanisms we can put in place, such as through local planning policy and power purchase agreements, and by influencing the West of England combined authority level on issues such as grid connection and providing community energy finance. And to give you an idea of where we are now and where we need to get to, Regen's latest renewable energy data reported that we may have something like 20 megawatts of renewable energy currently installed in Baines, although other estimates suggest that it may be slightly more. And that includes everything from little four kilowatt installations on individual roofs through community and energy projects and commercial schemes as well. And the modeling way back in 2019 about how we might get to zero carbon by 2030 suggested that we might need to be generating something around 300 megawatts um, by then. And so that is, that is quite a large uh, increase we need to achieve. Now, Baines has a long track record of supporting the community energy model. And in fact, 40% of the installed renewables we've got in the district is community owned. And that's making local control and local benefits real. And we want to continue along that path by having as much of the new generating capacity we can delivered through the community energy model. And that brings me to our panelists. So to introduce, I'm delighted to welcome John Malone, Development Director at Energy for All, Peter Kapener, Managing Director of Bath and West Community Energy, Don Weston, Director and Chair of Chelwood Community Energy, and George Blanchard from the Baines Planning Policy Team. Gentlemen, you're all very welcome and thank you for joining us. And I'd like to start by inviting John to make a presentation. Each of the speakers will make a presentation and then we will uh, move on to Q&A. So John, can I pass over to you? Uh, thank you, Alistair. Yeah, and well, uh, good evening, everybody, whom I can't see. Um, I, I will spend um, a couple of minutes just uh, introducing uh, Energy for All, who, who I work for, um, and just to, then to say something about the community owned wind energy projects that um, we've supported to give a sense of, I suppose, the art of the possible, what, what, what we've achieved in the wind energy sector in terms of community ownership. Um, I'll just share my screen. And uh, thanks uh, to um, Alistair and colleagues for the invitation to join the seminar tonight. I, I do live in Bath, Board. So, so I feel attached to the discussion, what is going on. My, my working life takes me uh, further afield. So the examples I'm talking about are from the Energy for All family of cooperatives uh, rather than local examples. But I think, I think the, uh, the idea is to give a flavour, as I say, what is 
possible and what has been achieved in the wind energy sector in terms of community ownership. To just complete a little bit of background on Energy for All. Uh, we're based in Cumbria. Um, we are a um, family of 30 independent cooperatives with a shared mission and, and Energy for All provides services to those 30 co-ops so they, they share um, the services that we provide. Um, and we, we support co-ops with a mix of technologies, uh, wind, solar and hydro. And counting the volunteer directors who support those boards, there are about two to three hundred people involved as volunteers across those, those cooperatives. Uh, and we're a staff of 23 at uh, Energy for All based, 50 percent in, in Cumbria in the office there um, when the office was open and a number of us home working across the UK to try and get to the projects that we uh, support and the new, the new projects that we're developing. You can see the spread of, of current, current projects that we've, we've got on the books and that we're helping to, to operate. Um, I'm going to say a few things about the various um, wind energy co-ops that are part of that mix. Um, there's a lot to say about each one, so I'm going to skip through in the interest of time. There may be time for questions. But I'm happy to, uh, you know, to continue engaging with with this dialogue. So, so there may be questions that come up over time, and I'm happy to feed in more detail. But in the interest of time, um, I'll start with. Uh, I'm, I'm following a little bit of a timeline in terms of when the projects were developed. Um, Energy for All was founded by Baywind. So, predecessing Energy for All is uh, preceding Energy for All is the Baywind Energy Cooperative that in 1996 brought about 1,300 members together to raise 1.3 million pounds to buy, to acquire an existing site of five turbines at Harlock Hill in Cumbria, which is why the energy for all history is so much tied to, to Cumbria and Barrow in Finesse. Uh, those those 2.5 megawatt turbines have operated until about 2015 when they were, they've been repowered, and I'll come on to that story at the end of the presentation. Um, but in terms of um, community, uh, Baywind set up um, Baywind Energy Conservation Trust and, and funding from the annual operation of the turbines was fed into a community fund managed by BWECT uh, to support projects in the, in the local area. But, but very fundamentally, Baywind has been at the heart of the Energy for All uh, family of co-ops. The 30 co-ops um, that I've described the 29 that followed Baywind owe a lot to Baywind as they were ready to lend money to startup co-ops to help get them going. So, so Baywind is very much at the heart of, of what has happened over the, uh, the, the, the 20 odd year history since, since then. One of the next projects that Energy for All was involved with, having been established in 2002, was, was West Mill Wind. Uh, you can see the photograph there, West Mill Wind Farm, five turbines, um, 1.3 megawatts each, six and a half megawatts in total. And around two and a half thousand people came together under that Energy for All share offer to raise 4.4 million pounds um, to build and then own and operate those turbines. You, you may well have seen those turbines as you travel into London. You can see them from, from the railway um, as you leave Swindon uh, from the A420 as well. They're just outside uh, Swindon in West Oxfordshire. It's probably right to claim that it's, it's the most visited wind farm in the UK, given its proximity to population. Um, uh, West Mill Wind has set up, uh, we set West Mill Sustainable Energy Trust as part of its outreach and community programme and has received countless school groups, um, planning officer training, politicians, other groups and interested parties. And they, they, they've counted more than 10,000 visitors to that site. So that the, the, again, the um, impact that that has had in terms of promoting community energy has been very uh, significant. At a different scale, um, Energy for All supported um, Drumlin in Northern Ireland. The first energy co-op in Northern Ireland was the Drumlin Wind Energy Co-op. Um, that was a partnership with a, a commercial developer who had, who had successfully brought six sites through planning but wanted, wanted to find the finance to develop those projects and had heard of the community energy route. So he contacted Energy for All and we helped to raise funding and set up the co-op. And now we support the operation of six 250 kilowatt turbines 
on separate sites. So it's a co it's a co-op, a multi-site co-op, much like the multi-roof solar that we're now seeing. It's a multi-turbine project across um, Northern Ireland. It has 911 members, um, and and um, the fund, total fundraising was 3.4 million. In terms of community, um, the Drumlin members have set up uh, an, another cooperative, um, Northern Ireland Community Energy, which supported by the um, some of the profits of the Drumlin turbines has gone on to install solar installations on schools and has set up the Northern Ireland Community Energy Fund, NICE fund, to which groups can apply uh, to, to find funding to support their own, their own energy projects. And then to complete the picture and bring us up to date, um, we, as well as standalone community energy projects, we do we have worked significantly uh, with FALC Renewables. We have seven um, projects where the, the cooperative, the local community cooperative, has taken a stake in the neighbouring larger wind farm. The example there of Spirit of Lanarkshire, um, there are 605 members of that co-op that raised £2.7 million to invest in two neighbouring wind farms, a, a, a six turbine wind farm and a 12 turbine wind farm. They may have been beyond the reach of entirely community owned development, but the partnership with the commercial developers worked very well there. So that's an example of a kind of a larger scale where the community takes um, a, a sharing role in the project. Uh, and Four Winds um, is an example of, again, multi-site, two 500 kilowatt turbines on two former colliery sites in uh, York, South Yorkshire and Derbyshire. Um, those projects um, brought 813 people together to raise the money necessary to build those two EWT 500 kilowatt turbines, which received feed-in tariff support. And there too, uh, Four Winds commits um, money each year to a community fund to support um, the, the um, uh, communities around those turbines. We've had quite a few applications from, from uh, organisations that may well have got funding pri uh, previously from, from the, the mining activity that was taking place in, in those areas. And to bring us back full circle, um, I mentioned Baywind at the, the start of the presentation. The high winds, turbine, high winds turbines, which are um, uh, probably we think uh, we hesitate to, to make the claim but it, it, it's certainly the the England's probably largest community owned wind farm we're not sure if it's the UK's largest community wind farm but three, two of those turbines stand now on the Harlock Hill site so, so the repowering of the, of the Harlock Hill site uh, back in 2015 uh, gave birth to, to High Winds a new community benefit society which uh, has raised initially 3.9 million to, to build the two turbines and then a further uh, fundraise allowed us to acquire the adjacent um, Mean Moor site with uh, three identical turbines, uh, making a five turbine wind farm of 11.5 megawatts. The members there, 1,166 members, last year voted to, um, it was a very windy year in 2020 and High Winds was able to give 100,000 pounds to community causes last year. Uh, to continue the work that Baywind had started and, and some of that money went to the Baywind Energy Trust. Some of that money, the, the High Winds directors are, are at liberty to, to allocate and receive applications from local community projects. So the outlook for High Winds is to try and support projects across the whole of, uh, of the South Lakes um, and that, that part of Cumbria. So quite an ambitious project, but hopefully the, the, the benefit to community will, will, will be significant. Um, I hope that's given a little bit of a flavour, Alistair, and um, as I say, I can contribute more detail through questions or, 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 or ongoing. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, John. That's, that's tremendous. Um, now, Pete. Pete Capener from Bath & West Community Energy. Over to you. help if I unmute myself. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I've just been asked to, I was just saying thanks uh, for the introduction, Alistair. Thanks for inviting me along this evening and uh, been asked to give a bit of a background to community energy in, in the Baines area. Uh, so I'll talk about 
what Bath and West Community Energy have done, but also uh, make reference to um, Chelwood Community Energy's contributions as well, and also uh, developments in Canesham with Canesham Community Energy. Um, so for Bath and West Community Energy, we, we were set up in 2010. We've raised 20 million pounds, uh, about half and half, half and half from community finance and debt uh, via Tridos, the ethical bank. We've built out nearly 12 and a half megawatts of community renewables, uh, which is enough capacity to match the annual demand from around about 4,000 typical homes. So not masses, but not insignificant. And uh, not all of that 12 and a half megawatts is in Baines, but a significant proportion of it is. Some of it's in West Wilts, some of it's Somerset. But together with the five megawatts that Chelwood Community Energy has also built out, as Alistair said earlier, about 40% of all the renewables that have been built in, in Baines to date. So making a significant contribution there. The projects that we've developed, uh, a number of ground mount solar schemes, so solar panels in fields, ranging in size. Um, uh, this project in Wilmington near Marksbury, uh, we just did a, a biodiversity study uh, of that, which showed that biodiversity had increased by over 50% since we built it in 2015, uh, primarily due to uh, wildflower meadows. Um, but for other reasons too, demonstrating that solar panels don't mean that uh, the, the land is a wasteland uh, alongside the solar. We've also built out a lot of rooftop schemes, again, ranging in size on schools, community buildings. This is on um, Lewis House, Manva Street, uh, council buildings, what were council buildings. Um, one small uh, water wheel, modern water wheel at Barthampton Old Mill Hotel, for those that you know that. Um, we haven't yet built any wind turbines and it's great to hear from John uh, what's possible. We'd love to see some wind turbines in, in Baines and we're looking for sites at the moment. So all of this is really is good, we feel. Uh, we've developed a number of projects, but more than just the megawatts and the electricity that they generate, it represents a different way of doing business, focusing on building out community-owned projects uh, where the community enterprise owns the project, ensures that the control stays locally. So uh, I referred to Bath and West, Chelwood, which is Don's organization, Canesham Community Energy, also looking to develop uh, projects in the Canesham area as well, who controls uh, are the members, the people who invest in the projects. Uh, uh, for us, um, the minimum investment's £100. We have a share offer open at the moment. Um, gives, uh, uh, creates a democratic organisation, one member, one vote, regardless of shareholding, and the control stays locally. Um, and then finally, who benefits? Uh, and it's the community, ultimately, because we're as community benefit societies, we are all not-for-profit organizations set up for the benefit of the community. We recycle surplus back into those local communities. And to date, we've distributed, well, we will have distributed with this year's allocation, 260,000 pounds to date. Chell would have done 100,000, including this year's allocation. And they go back as grants to support further carbon reduction, fuel poverty work. We've supported um, uh, share and repair projects, transport, e-bike projects, Energy Sparks there, the schools project, which has now grown into a national scheme, started from Transition Bath. Uh, we, we've supported community orchards, um, local food growing projects, a whole wide range of sustainability initiatives led by local communities. So this is the real benefit of this community model. Um, not only does it deliver the clean renewable energy that we need, it also draws in the local community, creates opportunities for people to get involved and generates local value and local benefit as well. So what next for us? We're developing new projects. 
we've got another 15 megawatts or so of, uh, so double what we've got already. Um, in terms of rooftop, ground mount solar, we started looking for wind turbines and uh, more of that shortly, but we also need to start looking at other technologies, uh, battery storage, uh, EV charge points, we're looking at heat pumps, domestic and also community scale. We need to think about how are we going to transition away from gas for space heating and oil, petrol, diesel for transport. And that's ultimately going to be more electricity. We're going to need more electricity to help this decarbonisation process, which ultimately means we're going to need more and more renewable energy. So 20 megawatts is nowhere near enough, uh, which is what we have at the moment. We're looking at a tenfold increase over the next 10 years for us uh, in terms of capacity and hopefully more. Uh, but that needs community support. That level of growth, that needs community support. And we found that the community model, the community energy model helps build that support and gives opportunities for people to involve, get involved. But we also need to manage that electricity demand that we're gonna see increasing a lot smarter. If we look at it at a household level, the little wiggly line there is a, an indication of what you might see in terms of electricity demand during a typical day. First peak uh, in the morning when we all get up, goes down in the middle of the day when we have go to work. As I say, this is a typical demand. Uh, everybody's different, of course. And then electricity demand ramps up in the evenings uh, for obvious reasons. Of course, when you look at when the solar is generated, if we put solar panel on our roof, we're generating electricity in the middle of the day, um, not always when we need it. So we're starting, we as BWC are starting to look at projects as to how to support households and others shift electricity demand from peak times when it's the most carbon intensive. In the Southwest, you can reduce your carbon emissions by up to 50% just by moving electricity demand from the evening peaks to the middle of the day uh, so that we can make better use of the renewable energy that we're generating. And this is true at a domestic level, but it's true across the whole country. We need to be thinking about how we can utilize the renewable energy that we're generating far more effectively. When we start looking at how we do that and automating that process through smart technology and the internet of things and all of these clever ideas, it's gonna require a lot more public trust to enable third parties to control our appliances, to share data. Uh, and again, this is something that's gonna need community buy-in. Ultimately, we're looking to be able to supply electricity directly to local people from our community schemes. That's the end game for community energy, holistic, local supply, um, that's the where we're aiming for. So what can we do? Well, clearly there's a lot of individual action uh, that can be done. And we've got information for people that are interested to delve into that, a lot of links where you can find more information, including uh, the council's own uh, website around uh, taking action, energy action in the home. But just thinking collectively, if we're gonna get uh, the level of renewable energy installed that we need, we're going to have to think collectively as well as not just individually. When we think just individually, it's very easy to get disillusioned. Soon as we start working together, we can build momentum, build a sense of collective purpose. And there are a range of things that we can do. First, we need to make our voice heard in support of change. It's very easy. Normally, we kind of tend to make our voice heard when we're <laughs> when things go wrong, when we want uh, we want to oppose things. We need to move to making our voice heard when we in support of things. And the first opportunity to do that is uh, with uh, the Baines Local Plan, which is out for consultation now, has some really positive climate change policies in it in there around sustainable construction, but importantly about wind energy as well. Without those positive policies on wind energy, we're not going to get uh, planning success around wind energy. So please, if you don't do anything else, uh, get online, Bain's website, and look to see how you can support 
those climate change policies. Maybe encourage the council to go further. There's more that we can do, but at least uh, support the, what, what we've got there. Support the community energy organizations that are already out there, sign up to their newsletters and, and maybe invest in, in share offers that are out there. There's, there's already uh, um, a lot of experience within Baines that we can take advantage of, of how to mobilize communities in support of the change that we need to see. You could help us identify potential sites. We've got information on our website about how to identify what is a good roof for solar. So maybe your school, your children's school or the place of work has got a large enough roof that we could put solar panels on it. If so, get in touch. And particularly if there are uh, projects in your vicinity, in your local community, new renewable energy projects that are going through the planning system, please, please, please support them. Don't just leave it to the people, that, the naysayers that don't want to see change to voice their opposition. And finally, talk to friends, family, neighbors, take people with you with any change that you want to see. We all collectively need to normalize the need for change by talking to people that we know and, and normalize the things that we know need to happen. Finally then, yes, in summary, um, we need to rapidly increase renewable electricity capacity locally, and we need to manage our demand better. We believe that one of the best ways of doing that is through community energy, working together to see the change in our own communities. So please get involved, talk to others, start supporting what you can. I think the question for us all here is not whether climate change is here. We know it's here. We know that impact is gonna be significant. Whatever we do now, we can't avoid that, that impact that's already baked into the process. The only question is, will we respond with the urgency and the scale that the crisis demands? So thanks, Alistair. That's me. Pete, hey, thank you very much indeed. That was very inspiring, a very inspiring call to action. And I would just echo that. Um, I didn't introduce myself at the outset, but I am a Baines councillor and I'm um, the, uh, Council uh, Renewable Energy Advocate, and I absolutely uh, endorse everything you say there. Um, please tell your councillors this matters to you. Let's get a, um, a feeling of the, the intensity of the support out there for, for renewable energy. Thanks very much. Now, I'm going to turn to Don Weston. Um, Don uh, is director and chair of Chelwood Community Energy. And if I could ask you a couple of questions, Don, could I, could I start by um, asking how you came to uh, engage with your community and create the interest in the project that, that, that you came together and what it was like working with BWCE to do it? Good evening, Alistair, and good evening, everyone. Um, a small group uh, in Chelwood, which is, if anyone locally knows, a very small village, um, formed uh, an interest in creating a solar farm, uh, got so far in terms of planning, but found that the practical obstacles in terms of turning this idea into a reality were far too big for us. And we needed to turn to Bath and West Community Energy, which had the skills uh, and the technical expertise to help drive the project through um, and to provide us with the um, skill sets that we needed to subsequently run the project. Thanks. And what benefits has the scheme brought to the community? You've been generating for around six years now? We've been generating for six years. Um, we set up a Chelwood Com uh, Community Fund as a charitable trust um, to handle the surplus that we generated from the solar farm. So in effect, we, there are two separate enterprises. The Chelwood Community Energy uh, generates the, the cash and Chelwood Community Fund receives whatever surplus we're able to, to give to them. And they distribute that um, based on applications they receive from the community. And they've supported a, a very wide range of causes um, in the local areas, I think you're aware. I am indeed, and I'd just like to say thank you very much indeed for 
the support you've given to Zero Carbon Compton, which is a, a wonderful community energy group uh, in my own area of, of, of Baines. We're very grateful to you for the support you've given us. Good. Thanks, Don. And so um, if I can turn now to, to George, George from the planning policy team, um, please give us a, a flavor for how planning works with all of this and, and how it um, supports the, the renewable energy push. Sure, uh, I'll just share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can all see the presentation. So um, this is to sort of carry on Pete's klaxon of uh, responding to our local plan partial update consultation. Uh, thanks, Pete, for, for pushing people towards it. Uh, so that in terms of what we're doing with the local plan, the consultation is running from the 27th of August to the 8th of October. Um, so this is um, a partial update of our core strategy and placemaking plan. Uh, primarily to fill uh, a, a slight vacuum that we have in the West of England combined authority area with the, the JSP, the Joint Spatial Plan, having been withdrawn last year and we're waiting for more details on the, the new uh, West of England uh, spatial development plan to come through. So in the meantime, we're We've got issues within Baines uh, relating to the climate emergency and, and the ecological emergency that we'd like to address. So we've revised our policies in light of that. Um, at the same time as doing the consultation on the local plan, we have three uh, supplementary planning documents that are out for consultation. So uh, one of them is the Energy Efficiency Retrofitting and Sustainable Construction, SPD. Uh, we also have a transport and development SPD and uh, houses and multiple occupation SPD. The, 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 the first two of those SPDs are uh, highly relevant to this discussion. Uh, so the energy efficiency one would be more what people can do in terms of retrofitting their homes. And it also goes into quite a bit of detail on what you can do with uh, the sort of more listed buildings and the Georgian housing stock within Bath. So there's, there's some good information in there, so I'd encourage um, people on the, on, the, on the webinar to go and have a look at those. Uh, in terms of what we're doing in the local plan, uh, I've, I've listed a few things there, but the, the key one in terms of this discussion is what we're seeking to do with renewable energy. So within the current plan, we have a policy called CP3, um, which we're revising. So through revising this, we're, we're looking to create a positive approach for the determination of planning applications. And just to carry on what Pete was saying, we, had, we have a, a target within the core strategy of 110 megawatts by 2029. That's separate to the 300 megawatt figure that you sometimes see listed, which is based on modeling. So it's kind of like a snapshot of what Baines would need to do to reach uh, uh, carbon neutrality by 2030. The, the target within the core strategy is based on evidence and we're, we're also going through a process of review, reviewing that evidence and to see what on the, on the ground capacity resource that we have, the different types of technology within Bain. So that's gonna be coming out and will be part of our new local plan. But in the meantime, the target within the, um, the local plan partial update is this uh, 110 megawatt size. Um, um, scale so um, in terms of other other means that we're looking to do so we provided specific criteria so that wind energy proposals can be considered uh, this is based on landscape potential and we've um, had uh, a study done which provides updated mapping which is also available as an online tool so you can go on the map click on your area and see what sorts of scales of uh, re uh, renewable energy in terms of wind and solar you could potentially get in that area and it goes into details of types of mitigation that you could look to do for things like solar uh, and it, it's quite a useful resource for community energy and just generally for people to look at if they're considering uh, schemes within within their locality uh, so we also have reviewed our criteria for ground mounted solar uh, again, this is seeking to guide development to the best locations, but it's not a limiting approach. You could you could have it have solar uh, in in areas of higher landscape 
um, or lower landscape potential, but yeah, it just sort of sets that out in a bit more detail. So just in terms of where we are in the process, we've been through two rounds of consultation before. So we're at this draft plan stage, which is a formal consultation, which primarily is a test for soundness, which covers as the plan is justified, effective, positively prepared and in line with national policy. Uh, so comments made at this stage go directly to the inspector for examination, uh, which as you can see is due to take place uh, sort of latter part of this year, uh, early next year. And then we have adoption uh, timetabled for June, 2022. Uh, so yeah, this is just some of the links for the consultation. Uh, we can also send this around to everybody as well, just so you've got it. So um, in terms of responding, we've it's an online response portal and web form for both the local plan and the su supplementary planning documents. And we're encouraging responses online just to make sure that responses get put into the right consultation area. Obviously four consultations going on at the same time can be, can be a little bit confusing for everybody. Uh, and we also are, uh, have capacity to receive paper, paper copy comments. Um, so yeah, just to follow on from what Pete said, we, we're encouraging residents to, and communities and other stakeholders to respond. And uh, we've also been holding a series of webinars on different topics. So yesterday we had one on the retrofitting SPD, uh, which you can review which you will be able to review on our YouTube channel. Uh, it's going to be uploaded tomorrow, I believe. Uh, so it's worth looking out there. There's, there's also another webinar just generally on the local plan partial update tomorrow at lunchtime if you'd like to sign up. Uh, and just another uh, slightly different plug, but we, we also have, uh, my colleagues in development management have a pre-application advice uh, service for community renewables, uh, which was uh, launched earlier this year. This, this sort of is in recognition that the, the cost of, uh, of planning applications and pre-app pre advice for, re for renewable energy schemes, particularly things like solar where the land takes quite large, uh, it can be, can be a barrier to uh, people finding out information and, and bringing projects forward. So we have a link there where you can obtain uh, a reduced fee. And I understand the fee is then, uh, if you pay if you do pay the fee and go ahead with the service that's then taken off if you go through for a, a, a full application so it's just a way of getting advice on what you could do in your area without uh, paying the full the full sort of commercial rate for planning advice and and that's the last slide for me that's great george thank you very much and and thank you very much to all our panelists that's given us a really interesting review from large scale uh, projects down to really, really small ones and um, the, the framework around them. And uh, we'll move now to, to some questions. And there's, there's one which looks as though it's got George's name written on it from Nick Baker, which uh, coming from where you've just been, what is the likelihood of obtaining planning consent for a single wind turbine or a group of say, two to five turbines in the Chew Valley, taking into account impending new planning regulations. Can you provide any comfort there? Um, so at the moment, whilst the, the local plan partial update is an adopted policy, it, the, the, if, it, if a plan application were to come in today, it would be quite a slim chance. But once the, once the adopted plan is enforced, hopefully by June, 2022, we, there would be the policy framework there for wind turbines to be considered. Obviously, there's quite a range of factors you have to look at when looking at renewable energy sites and wind wind turbine as well, wind turbines as well. So um, but in, in terms of getting off the ground, we, like I said, we've got the uh, the landscape assessment. Uh, so I'd, I'd encourage looking at that and seeing seeing how uh, the sites or sites that you're looking at relate to that and what sorts of scales of turbine and, and project that you could you could get. Um, and also um, make use of the um, the, the pre-application service that I mentioned on the on the last slide would, would be my my overall comment. Thanks very much. That's that's very helpful. Does anyone else want to chip in on that from their their experience? No. Okay. Thanks, George. Um, looking at a, another question um, from Jackie Head. 
Can BWCE help villages in rural areas in Baines create electric vehicle charging stations powered by solar energy, either on buildings or in freestanding units? Pete, that sounds like one for you. Uh, yes, thanks, Alistair, and thanks for the question, Jackie. Um, yes, we can, um, although not just yet. Uh, we're in the process of finishing a feasibility study looking at um, community-owned uh, EV charging network in the Bradford and Avon area um, goes into Baines just kind of around Freshford and um, but uh, depending on the outcome of that feasibility uh, we will uh, want to roll it out and the question is the balance of, between cost uh, of the, of the um, asset the charging station and the utilization so it's all about location, 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 as they say. And uh, and our belief is that if the network is owned by local people and we will give, if we do this, we would give preference uh, and financial value to local people in terms of the charging uh, discounts, um, we would hope that that would encourage greater utilization. But, so we would give us six months um, and we should know uh, a bit more um, information as to whether we can roll it out um, in Baines in rural areas. Thank you. Um, there's a, an interesting question from Phil Heath here about the justification of putting solar PV on farmland given that there is an ecological crisis, much of the destruction of rainforest is carried out to create land for agriculture, to feed the expanding world population, and that we have acres of unused space in areas such as car parks and rooftops. In other words, should we not be giving priority to solar PV as a bolt on to existing buildings and developments before putting it on farmland? I think that's probably a very, um, a very well, uh, an argument we're all very familiar with. Don, is that one that you would like to, to comment on? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, speaking from our personal experience, um, our site is some 26 acres of extremely low grade agricultural land that the farmer was pushed to make a profit on. Um, and he now enjoys a, a, a reasonable income from a solar farm. Um, so. I think there is a case for looking carefully at the land on which you would propose to put a solar farm. Yeah, uh, I think um, if I may kind of add, Alistair, uh, I, I think absolutely agree with Don. Uh, I think we should be giving uh, a having high priority on solar uh, on car parks and rooftops and all of those things. We definitely need to be doing those things. The problem is that we have to do stuff really quickly. Uh, and uh, the reality is if that those sorts of projects take longer to do um, for every, per kilowatt, it's it's quicker to do to go bigger. And and I do agree that there are constraints. There need to be constraints. We shouldn't be putting solar on high grade agricultural land, grade one, two, three A even. Um, uh, and as long as we avoid those, we can we can actually improve the land. As I was saying earlier, we take if we take the land out of intensive agriculture um, or intensive uh, kind of use, we can improve the land. Uh, and this is a temporary thing. It's not like cutting down the rainforest where it takes millennia for the trees to grow back and the ecosystem to, to reform. Take the, after 20 years or 25 years or however long the, the solar systems are there, you can take it away and immediately the land is back in use. It's a very, very different um, setup. But I agree, we, should, we shouldn't be using high grade agricultural land. We should be targeting car parks, rooftops, anything that we can do, but solar, can also be a, a benefit in creating the conditions in which we can increase biodiversity and address both the ecological crisis uh, as well alongside um, the, the climate crisis. 
Thank you, Pete. Yes. Um, looking back at the questions, one that came in very early from Amy Wilson um, was asking specifically about what individuals, businesses and Baines councils could do to address the gap in renewables. And I would like to draw attention to the, the current Solar Together uh, scheme, which is being run by the West of England Combined Authority. And Michaela has put in the chat function the link to go there. And uh, Steve Cross has also mentioned it in the, in, in the chat. Basically a scheme which allows individuals to join a group buying scheme so that they can buy solar panels and batteries for their uh, homes or businesses at uh, lesser prices than they would otherwise pay. And you can um, express your interest up to the 28th of September uh, with no obligation to go forward to buying, but at least you will get a quote, which hopefully will be attractive. Frank Thompson has a question. Must all renewable energy production be big scale, e.g. wind farms, or can it be done at a smaller scale, i.e. lots of turbines on rivers to supply small communities, e.g. restaurants, pubs, and agriculture? Um, I imagine this is specific to hydro. John, I know that uh, you've got a, a, a hydro scheme currently currently on the books, I think, up, up in uh, Scotland. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. I, I guess um, the question there is looking at much smaller scale because we, 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 I mean, the particular example you're talking about is, is uh, 500 kilowatt you know, again, a large scale community owned hydro project of, of, of two million pounds. I, I think the answer to the question Pete's touched on really, we need, we need to do so much and we need to think large scale, but within, within, within the constraints that we're, we're going to face to deliver those large scale projects, there can be considerably more difficulty per kilowatt in getting a small hydro project away than there is to get a, a large hydro project or, or a large other renewable energy project so, so whilst it whilst the question is valid and i think we look, need to look for all opportunities we mustn't lose sight sight of the size of the challenge that we uh, we face and, and and look for all opportunities that we have to develop renewables but that's not to discourage people from looking at what they've got around them if they've got an opportunity to develop a small scale site then they should be encouraged to do that and supported to um to try and make that a reality and thank you sorry pete just uh, just very quickly, it, there's a really interesting issue underlying that question for me as to what do we want in our landscape? Do we want to see smaller, large turbines or lots and lots and lots of small turbines? And what, what's the, the kind of landscape character impact of those two things? If we've got to get X number of megawatts to address the climate crisis, is it better to have a few smaller ones or lots and lots more, a few bigger ones? Or, and, I, and I'm not sure. I think it, there's a, it's a very kind of personal issue. I, I have my view, but I think people could take kind of very justifiably different views. And I think it's an important issue to consider and kind of discuss. Thank you, yes. Um, an interesting, in, in the Q&A from Baron Taha talking about solar farms being preferable to filling fields with maize to feed biodigesters. Um, and I think he's got an interesting point there. Um, we are beginning to come towards the end of our time and I would very much like to ask each panelist um, one specific question to gather your, your views. Given that this webinar is being held uh, in the run up to COP26, and that is where we're all thinking now to see whether our government can take a position of leadership um, on the climate. I'd like to ask each of you in turn, if I may, what one thing you would like our government to do in preparation for COP26 in a way of showing leadership or achieving something positive. And if I could go around the panelists in the same order as you spoke originally, John, could I start with you? There, there are lots of things to ask for, but I, I, I'll settle on listen to local authorities I think I think prescribing solutions is wrong and, and as we and as Peter's just alluded to some of these issues are very difficult so to listen to the debate and let people engaged in this to actually decide what solutions 
they want to implement, I think would be very, very helpful indeed. And obviously to provide, the, the ASCII is to provide support for wind energy, onshore wind energy, both planning and financial support. Thank you. Pete. Well, that's, it is such a difficult question. And um, just one thing, um, I, I think if, so if it's going to be one thing, it's got to be pretty strategic. Um, and so I'd say um, at the moment, our regulator, Ofgem, within the energy sector, its primary focus is on um, current consumers, which is understandable. Politically, it's very difficult to see electricity bills rise, um, but it, it's, it is quite short-sighted. Uh, Ofgem should be looking at the needs of future consumers. And in that context, carbon reduction and the transition to net zero should be their primary goal because um, ultimately that's going to benefit consumers in their pocket if they focus on it now rather than at some point in the future. So I think government tasking the regulator with a primary objective uh, to support the, the, the kind of net zero transition and to balance out their priorities around future and current consumers. Um, so there's a more, there's a fairer, with a fairer kind of distribution there, and we're not leaving, storing up all the problems for, for our kids and um, our grandkids. Thank you for that. Yes, I agree with that. John, how about you? What would you have our government do? I would like to see them insist that developers who build new buildings make them fully sustainable and low carbon. Thank you. I, I, you you mentioned me. I'm cheating slightly, but you mentioned to me yesterday that um, you live in a part of Cainsham where there's a lot of new build going on, where um, there has been absolutely no rooftop solar. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. And the developers were under no obligation and simply didn't bother. Well, let's hope they will feel under greater obligation in the future. Thank you. I sincerely hope so. George, what would you have the government do? Just a mute. Um, I'd quite like to see an updated national policy statement for energy. Uh, the, the existing one's very old now, it's over a decade or so old. Um, and yeah, it, it, it could be more encouraging. Uh, and that would certainly knock on to how local authorities could plan for uh, increasing uh, renewable energy. Certainly there's things that we would have liked to have done through this update that our hands were slightly tied on, so it would be good to see the government leading a little bit more and a, la and a bit like, as John men mentioned, uh, let local authorities take a bit more of a lead as well. Thank you very much. That's great. And thank, thank you for those suggestions. And... Uh, Alistair, sorry, I just... I, if, apologies, but there are, there are kind of lots of questions that we've not been able to answer. And I'm just... It's a question whether that whether we have a mechanism for following up and answering those questions in some other way after the event. We do, you're right, have um, lots of very good questions and it would be nice if we could do so, but I don't know whether the technology exists to do so. I, I mean, I, I see people typing away madly answering questions. Um, I don't know. Well, Mikhail, Let's kind of return to that. Sorry, sorry yeah. to have thrown that in. No, no, no. I, I, I'm glad you did. Thank you. Is is there a way we of doing? Can, yes, it's Michaela here. Yes, we'll um we'll do our best to um answer the unanswered questions and um send them out to the attendees. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. And so I would just like to to thank our our four panelists, John, Pete. Don and George, thank you very much for your time this evening, for uh, giving us the, the benefit of your wisdom and for encouraging us, I think all of us, uh, to look forward with optimism, never underestimating the challenge, but knowing that if we all play our part as individuals, as part of the organizations that we represent or we work in, and by lobbying our politicians and our government, then maybe we will make the difference that we need to make. And so thank you again for your time and good night. Thanks, Austin.